In Book 4, Chapter 2 of The Ancient City, Fustel begins to describe another inferior class that helped to advance the revolutions that eventually overturned this social and religious order of the ancient cities. And this was the plebeians, the plebs, as they were called at Rome. Now, the first thing he notes is that the plebeians are not the same as the clients. Plebeian is not just another name for client, and we make a mistake if we suppose that it is. And he goes through some historical evidence to show that the plebeians and the clients are different classes of people. The plebeians, as we'll see, are far lower on the social scale. What characterizes plebeians especially is that they are completely outside of the civic and domestic religion, this religion of the hearth fire of ancestor worship, which, according to Fustel, structures the entire social order and self-concept of these ancient peoples. The plebeians are the people who have no access to that religion. They are completely beyond the pale. The clients, the, the servants, still have some access to it indirectly through the activity of the king, in the case of the city, through the activity of the chief priest of the family, the, the father of the family, the household, the head of the household, in the case of the domestic religion. Their interests are presented to the gods. Prayers are offered on their behalf. They have the right to attend and pl maybe play a minor part in the sacred ceremonies that surround the hearth fire. So there's a way in which they are sort of lesser, maybe we might say outer members of the household, the clients. The plebeians are outside of this order entirely. And it's not hard to see that if there are enemies of this social order, some of the clients and virtually all of the plebeians will be prominent among them. So what's the character of the life of the plebeian? Being cut off from religion, there are many things that are significant in this ancient social order to which the plebeian has no access. He has no altar. He has no sacred fire. He has no ancestors to worship. He cannot worship and offer the sacrifices to his ancestors. Fustel even speculates they may not even have been permitted to pray. Right? These are people without gods, people deprived of gods, of the right of even calling upon the beings recognized as gods. They have no sacred marriage. Their marriages are entirely natural. So rather than the sort of sacred ceremony of being presented to the ancestors and united, in the, in the purity of the sacred fire, the plebeian marriages are, are bestial. They, they fornicate. They have promiscuous marriages like wild animals, as the, uh, as the patricians would say. The plebeians also have no property. Why can't they hold property? Because they have no termini. They have no boundary stones that are these religious markers that enclose a, an area of the earth, an area of land, and dedicate it to one family, to one person. We might say the plebeians can occupy the land, but they can never own it. They can't have ownership because ownership is a religious act, and these people are beyond the reach of the religion. The plebeians also have no protection under the law. They have no political rights. They can, it seems, be struck or killed without consequence by the patricians. Fustel quotes uh, an interesting expression adopted later when a law was passed to protect the persons of the tribunes, the law says, let no one strike or kill a tribune as he would a plebeian, right? Suggesting plebeians, you just run over them in the street, right? There's absolutely no consequence to be had for abusing or assaulting one. Why? Because they, they are in some, in the religious sense, we might say they're just non-people. They, they don't count. They are between the patrician and the plebeian, sorry, between the patrician and the plebeian, Fustel says, there is as wide a distance as religion can put between any two men. I think the most interesting part of this chapter is Fustel's speculation about the origin of the plebeian class. How did it come about that some people were so completely separated from this religion that neither they nor their descendants could ever be readmitted to it? Some of these are fairly conventional. He speculates, perhaps somebody has committed a crime which makes him unable to approach the altar that made, that unfits him for the company of the gods and of the religious people, the religious rites, well, he and all of his descendants then will be plebeians. Someone might renounce the religion, maybe a client might renounce his attachment to the religion in a fit of anger. 
from now on, he and his descendants, his family are plebeians. Or maybe somebody through negligence or forgetfulness would lose the sacred rights. And maybe I'll add to this, maybe there's an accident. Maybe the, the father and the eldest son of the family are killed in the same accident and nobody else has been trained and initiated into the secret words and gestures of the prayers that constitute the family religion. At that point, the family religion dies out. That entire family will be plebeians from now on. They have no ability to continue their sacred worship to offer the sacrifices that the gods, the souls of the ancestors under the earth, demand. But I think by far the most interesting speculation that Fustel does is sounds very, very Nietzschean. In fact, for, for 1864, he says, think about what it would require to generate this ancestor worship for the first time. It would be require a tremendous act of creativity, of imagination, and of will. And it may be the case that some people's ancestors, some hundreds of years previous, simply didn't have it in them to create, to sustain this kind of focused attention on the sacred fire, to offer, to sort of have the strength of belief in the ability to offer these sacrifices at the sacred fire to the spirits of the ancestors. For those families, there is no religion. There is no family religion to carry on. They simply will, in course of time, be plebeians. That's a fascinating idea, I think, predating Nietzsche by a decade or more, that suggesting this, this uh, sort of creative, imaginative willpower origin for the ancient religion. So as we're going to see coming on, the revolutions are going to be driven by this class of people, especially the plebs, who have no interest in the social order, who get nothing out of it, precisely because they are completely beyond all of its institutions in its reach. No property, no political rights, no law, no marriage, nothing. There's nothing in this social order for the plebs. That's my brief comment on Book 4, Chapter 2 of Fustel du Coulange, The Ancient City. I hope you found it interesting. Thanks for watching today. Goodbye.